So welcome to the Urban Income Show, where we speak with minority CEOs, CMOs, CTOs, and founders on their strategies for success. So I'm your host, Lavacha Chester, CEO of Growth Skills and Urban Income. And today's episode, we have Arjun Mahadevan, the co-founder and CEO of Doula. So Doula is a business in a box. Um, they're out of Y Combinator. They raised over $8 million, uh, and Arjun, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and what I love about you is that you're building in public and your content is fire because we get to learn from you, but also watch the ins and outs. And uh, I think you've proven that you don't have to be dusty to be a very successful CEO. So, um, so, so welcome to the show. Thank you so much. I think I'm just smiling because one, you nailed business in a box. That's what we're trying to define ourselves as. Mm -hmm. And there's lots of ways to form a company, but there's not many one-stop shops, which don't just form a company and then throw you to the worlds. But um, we also form a bank account for you, can do your taxes. And then you mentioned the content. We can get more into this. I'm loving the content you're putting out as well, uh, ranking in public and other things too. But uh, overall, I think it's a way to not only give a glimpse behind the scenes of how the company's being built, mm -hmm. but I think it's inspirational for founders. And I think we all in our life have that moment when someone gave the nudge or the encouragement, which set us on a path, which we wouldn't have done before. And right. I view that as content as you know what works for you when you're done working, content. You can record once and publish it and reproduce it millions of times. And that could be the nudge, whether it's educational content or inspirational content. That could help someone take their dream idea and then turn it into their dream business. So thanks a ton for having me on and really excited to chat. Yeah, absolutely. I, I want to jump into a lot of what you just what you just talked about. Um, but first, go where are you born? Go into your, a little bit of your background. And if, if any, do you think any of that um, has helped you become successful in your career and with Dula? Absolutely. I think it's incredibly intertwined. And the story of Dula, well, myself, uh, of course, but the story of Dula actually starts back in India, which is where my parents are from. They were born and raised in Chennai. Both of them were doctors. I'm not a doctor, um, and none of my brothers are too. So something fell, something fell through the cracks there. But <laughs> parents were both doctors in India and moved to England to start practicing medicine. Mm. And that's where my two brothers and I were born. Born in London, grew up in Cardiff, Wales. Believe it or not, I used to have a British accent, but that is now gone. How do you? And when I was that? six years old. <laughs> It, when you move to America, and this is, we moved here when we were six years old, and oh, six, part yeah. of it was, I guess, fitting in in America, no, and people in America speak differently than in yeah. England. But at the moment, when I look back, all I remembered was watching different cartoons, Clifford the Big Red Dog, and SpongeBob, and a, a new in schooler environment. But now I've been able to ask my parents, you completely rooted your life and moved across the ocean to America. And my parents are both doctors. They had to redo their residencies. Right. And I don't know how much you know about residencies, but they're a grueling multi-year process. They yep. had to redo those just to practice medicine. That's crazy. And I asked them why, and they said, as cheesy as it sounds, it's the opportunity that America provides. Mm -hmm. Access to American jobs, education, the unique cultural mixing pot that America provides that maybe nowhere in the else in the world can truly come close to. Right. And American opportunity, careers, jobs. And entrepreneurship is a huge one too, this idea mm -hmm. of the American dream. And the reason why that's connected is because something my parents instilled in me from an early age is control the controllables. And that's the work you can put in. Obviously, hard work's important, but you have to work on the right things. Um, but by moving to America, that allowed me to go to the University of Pennsylvania, meet incredible colleagues at Dropbox, get into Y Combinator along with my co-founder and end up where we are today with Doula, which wouldn't be possible without the thousands of customers we have globally. But at the end of the day, similar to how my parents immigrated here so that we would have access to America, we think that talent is everywhere, but opportunity is not. And by making it click button easy for a founder from anywhere in the world to start their dream business, we're increasing that opportunity and helping everyone access American entrepreneurship. So I think they're incredibly tied together to come back to your original question. My family, their immigration story here, I actually see or feel a bit of their story in every company we form. It doesn't mm -hmm. matter if you're in the US or outside the US, but this is a dream come true for someone and that makes the work we do very, very empowering. Yeah, and like I was telling you before, Peter and I, we started multiple businesses and 20 years ago when we first started our film production site, if I wish you were around, to, like Dula was around to really help because the thing too is like, I. I share your your immigration story parents we're from we're Guyanese 
So great grandma is Rajas is from Rajasthan, from India. And um, but we came when I was four and um and we were the first thing my brother and I sold was strings, like Jansport strings, like you'd sell them to like, you know, my mom, immigrant, made her own because <laughs> we were poor. So and then some girls saw that we had gold strings on your book bag. So like, yeah, we'll sell them to you too. So that type of thing. But um it's the opportunity is is what's important. And I like and you're helping start US businesses, right? Correct? Correct. So as of now, we're laser focused on forming entities in the United States. That being said, now that we're working with companies or customers from over 175 countries, people start asking, hey, can you do the same thing in Canada? Or can you do the same thing in India? I think that just goes to show we're in a space which has been dominated by paperwork for decades. And we came in with this fresh perspective and thought, does it have to be that way? And that's where sometimes I think being naive or being a beginner can be very helpful. Obviously, you need expertise, but we thought, why does formation have to be separate from these other things? And why can't you automate as much as possible? Um, but yeah, I think uh, I'm also curious to hear, I think, if you remember, like, what was it that made you start your own business in that single moment? I think about that a lot. I think reducing the friction is important, but I think education is so key, just helping people become aware. I'm curious for you, is there a specific moment in time when you realized or thought, I want to start this business or start one of your many businesses? Yeah, I, I, for for me, well, let's go with growth skills. The reason I started growth skills is because I was, you know, coming up in the advertising world, working for this uh, for this agency, and one, I was like, I know there's a better way to do the function of search engine optimization, all the things that I was building for them, and two, I knew that every company, like I was working for Apple and Western Union and Kaiser Permanente, and they all had training as part of like SEO training, whatever, we, we trained them on what we were doing. Um, Western Union specifically needed uh, their engineers, that they had engineers all over the place, and they needed them to understand that they can't make certain mistakes that they were making from a search engine standpoint, right? When you build something to production, what they would do is they'd keep that no follow tag on the site. And when you push that live, traffic disappears because you've blocked you know, your, your site from the search engines and that's real money. So training was important. And I, and I was like, every time I train these engineers, they'd never retain the skill. So I said, if I create, and this is back in the days where Linda was like the only video platform at the time, but, and then LinkedIn bought it. So now it's LinkedIn learning. And so I was like, Oh, I'm going to build a learning platform so that one, if one we're training these customers, they could learn on it. And then two, when you get there, We'll still teach them, but at least they would have reviewed the information and I'm not speaking another language to them. Um, and so, and, and speed up to now, you know, we're still doing that, but it's that education that will always be necessary. And I think the entrepreneur journey is so complicated and so difficult. And all the things that like, all the things that you solve for these people, for entrepreneurs, really suck like no one wants to do that like set up the escort like all that stuff is just all awful so like you know i really like that that you're you're helping helping with that even from the tax filing and, and all that i think you're gonna have a very solid business well you already have a solid business but like your expansion too thinking about the growth when you think about countries as markets so canada or whatever i think you're gonna you're gonna do extremely well um what um when you when you think about how are you growing now right so marketing is key um oh before i get there do you think you, you talked about catalysts right like catalysts for growth right there's a moment that you know that spurred me to create what I, what what we're creating you know urban, on the urban income side i witnessed that you know that people like minorities myself included didn't get the financial education that that I, that I needed, right? And so I learned the hard way. So that's what, what why we created Urban Income. Um, so on that note, have you seen? So there's there's sort of the catalyst, something you love that you want to do. But now with the firing, so ten thousand plus people are losing their jobs. They're sort of forced into the position to hustle to start something legit. Have you seen a spike because of this in in, in people forming businesses? With you? We have. And I think this is also backed up in US census data. The government actually tracks and shows company formations year over year. And starting in 2020, right around the COVID boom, is when applications really spiked. And they've leveled off a bit, but they are linearly increasing. 
And I think what happened with COVID is many industries accelerated overnight. Think about things like remote education. All of a sudden, every single school had to go remote. Think about health, virtual health now. You couldn't go into the gym, so you had to have these classes or class passes. And then I think for formation, before having a digital presence was optional. You could have brick and mortar and e-commerce was this thing on the side. But overnight, it became default. You needed a visible, visible storefront online and an ability to sell online globally. I think that's reflected in, one, the businesses we're seeing. And yes, when people do leave a job, I think it can question, hey, should I do another type of job? Or maybe it's time for me to actually take that leap. And I, this is another thing too. I genuinely believe everyone has some sort of side hustle or idea inside them. It, it doesn't mean you have to build rocket ships to go to Mars, like, uh, like Tesla or SpaceX or Tesla's car has been SpaceX. Um, you could sell t-shirts. You could Maybe you like art and you want to design coffee mugs. There, there's so many different types of businesses. And everyone has, I think, that inner artist or that inner creator in them. Um, and most of the businesses globally, they're not venture-backed C-Corps. They're not raising capital from investors. 99.999, add nine more nine percents of companies out there or LLCs or S-Corps, but someone who's just bootstrapping a business is a side hustle. And that's how everything can start. So I do think at the end of the day, starting a business can be a kind of an impulsive decision. What I mean by that is you think about it, you think about it, you think about it. Maybe you meet the right friend. And I do think you are the average of the people you spend time with. They've actually done studies on this. It's called the five chimps theorem. But if you look at five chimps in the zoo, you can pick any one of those chimps and predict very accurately its behaviors and what it'll do by looking at the other four. We're, we're influenced by the people around us. But what's cool about today, I think, is that and this gets into content. I think the power of content is back in the day, and this is pre-internet, pre-social networks, literally the people around you is who you would see. But now you can create multiple circles by who you follow, what communities you're in, what group chats you're in. And I think similar to what you're doing with Urban Income, providing that education and the knowledge is so key. And I think a huge reason why I'm building Doula today is I lived in San Francisco and every day on my walk to work, I would get off the train, I would pass Twitter, pass Uber, pass LinkedIn, pass, pass Dropbox, pass Pinterest. And when you're doing that every day, and then you're meeting people who you met weeks ago who just decided to go start a company, you can't help but think, wait a second, what if I did that? Or what if maybe I could do that? And I think now, what's really cool is that content or information can do that, even if you're not physically there. And I think that's critical. Um, it's critical to build trust with customers. It's critical to educate. And then also, I think it's a fantastic way to grow as well, too. Yeah. And so you're, the channels you're growing. So I just checked your, your SEO rankings, and you're, you're flying up there. So Thomas and, and team are, are doing a good job there. And social, right? Like, well, you're, you must be pulling leads off of Twitter and LinkedIn at this point. Absolutely. And I think this is where it comes down to, as a company, and I'm very curious what y'all do on your side too, mm -hmm. but we, we, especially for entity formation, formation is this moment in time when it doesn't just, ha there's no specific checkbox for, hey, when you turn 21, you form a company. It can right. really happen at any time. So a lot of it is just in time user acquisition. And a lot of times it starts from a Google search, mm -hmm. which means you could run paid ads on Google. But what if you could just rank number one organically? And that won't happen overnight, but how do you rank content and backlinks? Very much abbreviating, mm -hmm. high quality <laughs> content and backlinks, rinse and repeat. And it, it takes time, it takes time, it takes time. You get to this point where you think, oh, it's what's the point? There's no return. And then all of a sudden, you start to see things inflect. Similar thing for social too. Um, people like to say that marketing doesn't impact them. Yet that same person is maybe walking around with a Starbucks cup and a Lululemon mm -hmm. jacket. They, they've seen right. seven times the rule of seven, whatever you want to call it. Yeah, they've seen yeah. the ads. So I think social, it takes time too. And you might not see the immediate return. But now, when I do certain posts, I get DMs saying, hey, by the way, I've been thinking about this LLC for a while. So I always like to think about there's multiple channels, like paid is obviously something we want to invest in, and it can help with near term growth. But what long term enterprise value we can we create? I think that comes from SEO, that comes from things like email and newsletters, and then call it social slash brand. But those things take time to build, but can really compound once you get them kicking. Yeah, absolutely. And the seven points that he's discussing, traditionally, they say it takes seven points of impression to, uh, to to get someone to convince them to buy. So imagine if you wake up in the morning, you hear obey your, obey your thirst on the radio, you ignore it, you walk, you see a billboard about Sprite, you know, you see it on the train or however you commute. By the time you get to lunch, if you have a, a choice, if, they hit, if they've traditionally hit you seven times, you had a choice between the Coke or the Sprite, 
you're going to obey your thirst and, and buy the Sprite. That's what he's talking about. And and Arjun's correct. Now, though, the channels are, are all over the place. You've got social, you've got access, you've got online, you've got SEO, you've got all the social channels, and the, your ability to create content is kind of free, right? It's just time and, and, and your willingness to do it. But I think also your willingness to be consistent. I think that is the in studying this and, you know, cause I'm also building my own personal brand and you could see that personal brands lead to business because people like doing business with people they like. That's just how, how the world works. And, um, and when you see the growth of these, these companies now, a lot of them are, are led by people. And then, um, and it starts with, you know, if you're doing B2B, LinkedIn and, and all of that, but you see all, all of the, uh, and I think some people shy away from that because like an influencer can be seen as corny or, or like dumb because, you know, kids do it or a waste of time, not a real career path, but you know, don't hate because they're taking it to the bank. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, look, actually, I agree with so much of what you said. First thing is. A lot of times on any social account, you can see like accounts have been growing on our side, which is awesome. And you can look at it and be like, oh, I could never get there. Like even let's just take like LinkedIn you know, mm -hmm. and tens of thousands of followers, right? Mm -hmm. The truth is that the tip of the iceberg and it looks like it's an overnight success, but I've been posting pretty consistently on LinkedIn for close to two years now. And back mm -hmm. in the day when I posted, you get crickets, you get nothing, you yep. get the text saying like, why are you posting this? Like, you know, yeah. people are just jabbing at you, et cetera. And you, you're, I don't know, you're at several hundred followers if you're lucky then, yeah. but you keep going and it's part of committing, but you can't just throw crap at the wall and hope it sticks too. Yeah. You're testing and you're iterating, but there's this slog where you're figuring out what works, what works. And then every once in a while you get an inkling of something that works, but it's, it's, it's kind of like not death by a thousand cuts, but like, growth by a thousand cuts. You're just mm -hmm. chipping away, chipping away, filling the bucket, filling the bucket. And then all of a sudden and you look at it and you're like, oh, it's working. But there's there's always that pivotal moment. Second thing, I totally agree with you. Companies can build brands, but end of day, consumer or enterprise, you're buying from a person. Mm -hmm. And I do think a personal brand or a person's always going to be more powerful than a company. doesn't mean a company can't take Nike, for example, very powerful brand, mm -hmm. but look at the athletes behind Nike. Right. Uh, and, and that's where I think people can draw an even stronger connection. Um, so I think both are absolutely very important, but the consistency is important. And I do think this applies to anything. This is a way more meta conversation or topic, but I think too many people stop too early. Um, if you saw, mm -hmm. let me put it this way. If you saw, if results were linear like this, everyone would be in incredible shape. Everyone would be an influencer on every social account. But the truth is progress is like this. And right. you know, you go to the gym, you look the same. You do it seven days in a row, you look exactly the same. But if you do it 70 days in a row, holy crap, you're going to be like, you know, I didn't know I had that muscle or I can jump three inches higher, whatever it might be. Right. Well, what advice, because you, I think you said something very, very important and you sort of glanced it over. The people that would, you get text saying, why did you post that? And I feel like an entrepreneur, especially when you first start out, your haters are going to be your friends. Your haters are going to have your phone number. And there's a lot of people who will tell you can't. What advice do you have for, for that? I think that's the hardest thing is it takes guts. I mean, I actually think you, you, exactly what you said too, where you get hated on. And, but I do think you have to lean into cringe. And that sounds so counterintuitive. It can, it can feel cringe just to hear that. But all of it's cringe when you start, but then all of a sudden, and this is, I find it fascinating. The second you hit, I don't know, a certain number of followers, then it's like, oh, that person's supposed to post content like that. And then people just stop saying things. But up until that point, it's like the validation or the hitting a certain number, whatever it might be. But I think this is, I think the hardest thing is that I think you realize you just have to lean into being cringe for any, any type of, not even business success, but any type of progress in life there's going to be these cringe moments. And I think especially on social, and you're totally right, it often will come from friends. Like they'll be jabbing you, ribbing at you. They'll see comments from social and whatnot. But um, I actually think, this is my take on this, I don't think that you ever get less scared or you get less fear. You'll still feel the goosebumps and like those types of jabs, we're all human, like you can't completely ignore them. But I do think through consistency, you get more brave. And that, that could maybe sound like the same thing, but you're always going to have the fear. Like those things will kind of zing a little bit, but you get more brave and you become more fearless. And you think, yeah, I'm just going to go do this anyway. Why? Because I've done it for 90 days in a row. Like what's day 91? And then you just build the muscle and it's like growing the muscle instead of getting less scared. And that's just the way I view it. But the only way to build the muscle is to post every day and just be disciplined about it. And 
you know, James Clear, who's one of my favorite authors, Atomic Habits, he says that scientifically, it takes 66 days to build a new habit on average. So I like to think, you know, like anytime new platforms, I'm like, I'm going to go for 66 days. And if I do it 66 days, I'm going to build the muscle. And, you know, it might be 50 days, it might be 70 or it might be 80. But like the gym or like anything, once you build the muscle, a habit is very hard to break. And then now you're going more on that habit versus the motivation, which you do need when you're starting. Right. And and on that road, what, what sort of routine, um, what sort of daily things do you do to, to continue to be successful? I do think the the day for me starts the night before. Um, I, everyone talks about the value of sleep. I've gone through this so many different tests and turns and twists, but I know that if I get a crappy night of sleep, I'll be more short tempered at work. I won't be as sharp. I'll have brain fog. I won't be able to be as engaging in conversation. So to me, it starts the night before. Um, getting a good night's sleep, you know, seven, seven, eight hours, whatever that might be. Sometimes it's less, but you know, seven days is what I try to target. Um, to me, getting some exercise in first thing in the morning, I feel like a completely different person. And that's the thing too. It doesn't have to be all or nothing. Literally, it could be some push-ups or like a little walk, but doing something in that morning really makes me a better person throughout the rest of the day. And I've also experimented many other different times it doesn't happen consistently unless it's first thing in the morning. Um, so that's just something for me. And then the other habits I would say are, um, I think it comes down to like consistency. Like you can't choose everything. So pick a few things and be hyper consistent. Um, so like if we're talking about content, for example, I think honestly, anyone, if they take, I don't know, take LinkedIn, if they, if they committed for three years to posting every day, and let's say every 30 days, they did an analysis of the top 20% of posts and then bottom 20%. I think they grow their account tens of thousands minimum. But that's kind of a scary thought because you know in those first 90 days, you're going to get the text, you're going to get the ribbing. Uh, and then a year in, you might have nothing too and nothing in terms of you know the validation or the followers. But there's not if you can commit to something for that long of a time, all it turns into is a game of showing up every day. And then, then it becomes pretty fun because then you realize what's working and what's not working there too. You know, on that point, too, what I realized, too, I know we're talking about haters, but there's a lot more people rooting for you than you know, especially as you get success. And you, you actually start to help them. Um, I, I was just funny. I've gotten positive phone texts when I put out certain posts, which is, like, really encouraging, too. So if you're listening, just do it. Like, don't get out of your own way. Get out of your head. Just embrace it and go and stay consistent. And your quality will get better over time because exactly what Arjun said, practice, and you'll learn different formats and you'll get the, the muscle and, and all of that. Um, from a, from, what are you most proud of that Dula has done, accomplished top three things in the, in the last five years? Number one would be, and I think this is the most special part of the company, is you get to, a company is its people. And we mm -hmm. get to work with some of the most talented, ambitious, smartest people I've ever met. And I'm, I'm learning every day from that. And that makes it very fun for me. I think the other part of that too is there's an opportunity cost to anyone's time. And th there's an opportunity cost in my time working on this too. And anyone mm -hmm. has to believe in it enough to spend their time, 24 hour a day, sleep eight hours, you eat for maybe an hour or two, whatever it might be. Work is going to be at what, at least eight hours. And then you have time after. So I like get 30 of your life is work. And to me, it means right. so much that people believe in doula enough or investors, customers, but especially we call ourselves Dulians, but people at Dula believe enough to, to work here too. So um, that that means that's probably that's the single number one thing. The second thing, and I guess these are all one A, one B, one C, is the customers who've trusted us. The very first customer who trusted us, despite us not really having a product or service, and then now it's thousands of customers. This would not be possible without them and their trust and their feedback. And there's always those early adopters who are willing to take a leap on new tech or a new product. Wouldn't be possible mm -hmm. without them. And I think the third thing I would say is you slowly start to realize the impact externally you can have on others. And you don't hear it at first, but for example, they've actually they've studied this on any social media platform. It's the cardinal rule is that 90% of people are lurkers. They actually will not post, but they're there and watching. 9% yeah. Are curators, meaning they'll like and comment, but they won't be creating. And then the one percent, it's actually one percent. They've tested this on multiple platforms, are the creators who actually post content. Mm -hmm. You don't really realize that ninety percent. You, you see the nine percent commenting and then one percent posting, but a couple of things. One, yeah. that ninety percent, they're watching, and you're totally right. Sometimes you'll post something and you get 
text from people you had no clue, hadn't talked to in years, and they say, hey, I've gotten this. They say, hey, it feels like I'm talking to you every day. We haven't talked in months, but it feels like I'm having right. a convo with you. Or, hey, like I'm rooting for you. Hey, I think it's fearless what you're doing, posting, posting, like don't give up, et cetera. And in those small moments, it means a lot. And the other thing I'll finish with here is just by posting, you're already in the 1%. Just clicking mm-hmm. post on any of these platforms. So I love what you said. You have to get out of your head. Do you have to be clean and to cringe, kick the ego away or push it down every single day? But I think number three is realizing it takes guts to try for something. And failure is baked into any new venture, but that gut, those guts and taking that risk can really inspire people. That's amazing. Um, what, what did you, switching over to, to your finances, what do you wish you did with money um, sooner? Learn more. And this is why I love what you're doing with urban income. I think I studied business undergrad and I took accounting courses and finance courses. And even now I still feel like I should have learned those things in high school and done it at a much more robust, rudimentary, explain like I'm five way or not even explain like I'm five start there, but then these are building blocks for everyone going forward. So I think the biggest thing, how do we just improve education there? And there's now great courses online, and I'm very lucky to have some friends who maybe work more in finance or closer to money who I can lean on, you know, family members too. But I think the single biggest thing regarding that is just understanding what to be doing earlier on. And I think a big reason for that is compounding is the eighth wonder of the world. Uh, that could, Whether it's SEO, whether it's email, whether it's social, but especially for money. So starting to invest when you're 21 versus you're 30 can have a huge impact down the line. Um, so, but the only way you'll know that is from education even earlier on too. So education is the most important thing. I'm all ears. If you have other resources and I think everyone is, and it's awesome why what you're building too and the content you're putting out is so critical and so important too. Yeah. One of the, that, that was fantastic. So I was telling you, I was talking to Curran, who is, um, who's Snoop Dogg's business partner in the venture firm called Casa Verde. They, they invest in like cannabis businesses, ancillary businesses. So like, Think of uh, Dutchy, I believe they've invested in. So some really, really cool businesses. And um, and he was just like, you know what? Manage your burn. And I was like, manage your burn. And he kept talking. I was like, oh, just don't spend money. And I was like, I realized. And so him and Beth Perretta say, said the same thing. And I think why I bring that up is like a lot of people think that, you know, and it goes back to what you said earlier about control. Right, you could control how much you spend for the most part, right? Like I feel like the entrepreneurship or the the, the aspirational world out there is like make more money, do all this, make more money, make more money. But sometimes it's about spending less. Uh, and the formula, if you're running a P and L, it's like you know not not wasting, not spending more than you earn. And and so that was like you know they they both on um, Beth and Beth also just really told a crazy story of how she dramatically downsized in order to uh and she launched the first uh, female ford racing team um in the indy 500 like in, in indy racing did you have to do anything you know drastic to sort of adjust your lifestyle to be able to to, to, to sacrifice to basically make doula happen before starting doula i used to work at dropbox and i didn't start the company right away with my co-founder and also we didn't get venture funding right away. So there was a gap when I was exploring different ideas. And during that period, I actually had some money saved up and I actually started sending out these weekly investor updates to my family and some friends where I would give an update on, hey, like here's literally my personal runway. I would put that every week in the updates and I would share what I'm doing. And I think it was a form of accountability, but I think the number one way, whether it's you know tracking anything in life is to have visibility. If you're not looking at it, you know, what isn't measured can't be managed. That could be anything for your weight, for your finances, your habits, whatever it might be. But I think that was the first step is, hey, having some cash saved up to be able to really explore different ideas. And then eventually we got into Y Combinator and that gave us some capital and funding there too. But number one is I think, you know, for anything, if you want to even top line growth for your company, if you're only looking at it monthly, you'll only have a level of insight. Versus if you're looking at it daily, then you can see the inflection points or understand the levers and dials better. So I think I, that's what I'm trying to do across the board for everything is just have a better day-to-day outlook or even week, week-to-week minimum. But if you look at things weekly or daily, I think you can get better insights into things. 
Yeah, no, that's the spot on. What um, what side hustles have you had, or different ways of making money besides your like standard day job? I haven't monetized any of the side hustles I was working on, but before, and I think this is the other thing too. Doula is a business which is growing, which is incredible. But I think before that, there were at least three or four things I tried which didn't work. It's kind of like this graveyard of things, but they didn't work, but they helped inform where you get to today and you learn from them too. I think it's part of the process for anything, this failure, and it gets pushed under the rug. But any successful company, a successful, you know, whatever growth customers, there's a whole, 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 whole road, if you will, of failed things that didn't work. And some of these other side hustles or I guess ideas I tried, I tried to build a social fitness app. I thought, hey, instead of you know Strava, which is a way to go run with a friend, why can't you do that for weightlifting or for other sports? Uh, kind of like this class pass meets Instagram. That flopped. But here's the thing. When I launched that, I did a Twitter thread. It went viral for my standards back then. And some, an investor reached out and he did not want to invest. So that was, I guess, a bit of a bummer. But he said, hey, like this thread looked cool. You have an interesting background. Let's connect. Fast forward three months, he introed me to my current co-founder. And that wouldn't have happened unless I did that thing. So you can always connect the dots in hindsight. I worked on a different app, which helped people create these lists. We called it Rushmore. Like, so four faces on Mount Rushmore, you can list your four favorite things. And realize there, hey, you're competing with Twitter. Twitter has this network effect already. That's a bit tough. But through that, I actually got to play around with Figma a little bit, which is a design tool. So now I have basic proficiency there. So in hindsight, all these things add up. In the moment, you're not entirely sure how it's going to help or not. But I think those are side hustles, if you will, the things I was working on before. Um, however, most of my energy and time now is spent on Doula specifically. Um, but I do think, again, I'm trying to brush back up on piano. And in a weird way, like that's a good way to distract myself from work or have some time outside of that. Not monetizing it at all, but I think it's, you know, important to have some other hobbies outside of work too. Yeah, absolutely. I like I like everything that you said because those like those failures, you always learn something from it and meet a partner or anything. Cause any any number of the things that I've ventures that I've started, same same thing. You build you build a set of skills or you learn this or you learn what not to do <laughs> in the next time. And um and yeah, I think that's yeah, that's that's absolutely amazing. And um do you guys so do you help businesses in cannabis also start up? Like or, or are there sort of uh roadblocks? Here's a little tidbit. You can form a company or form an LLC if you're a cannabis business, really if you're any type of business. That's that's legal, of course. You can't do something illegal. But many banks will not let you open a bank account if you are a money services business or adult entertainment or cannabis. So the holdup can actually be a little bit down the line when it comes to opening a bank account. Although I am learning more about different financial institutions or banks that are willing to work with new types of companies. And there's always growth takes time or change takes time too in terms of types of businesses that were once deemed high risk because they're new. And then in the future, hey, it's a no-brainer. Everyone can serve them. But to recap there, oftentimes you can form an LLC or entity for any type of company. However, when it comes to opening a bank account, depending on the bank and their restrictions, that can be at a federal level or international level with country-based restrictions or money category, sorry, business category restrictions, then you might have some issues there. Yeah, for sure. So I think what part of why I'm doing this too is to in introduce people I think that should know each other. So I'm going to introduce you with Curran, who uh, who runs Casa Casa Verde. Amazing. Um, I think if anything, you'll hit it off. Um, and if something happens, that's even better. So that's fantastic. One, if someone's listening, um, what bit of advice would you would you give them if they want to work with you or maybe um be a mentor, a mentee, anything like that? This has been a personal motto of sorts, I think this year especially, but I it's something I well, crap, I wish I'd done earlier is shoot your shot. I recently did a post that really <laughs> resonated on asymmetric upside. Uh what that means is hey, what are things you can do? Or there's asymmetric opportunities. There's things which have a small amount of risk with high upside. You want to do more of those. Versus there's things which have small amount of upside and a large amount of risk. Um like examples like those are yeah, I don't know maybe like reckless gambling or doing something illegal. Like, yeah, maybe you get a tiny bit, but there's huge downside. You go to jail or something like that. But You're things right. like sending a tweet, starting a newsletter, 
an angel investment, starting a company, a bite-sized company. You don't have to quit your job and put all your life savings in it right away. Um, right. I don't know. If you see someone at a coffee shop, go say hi to them. The worst is they say, hey, don't talk to me. The best is, hey, you have a friend or a partner, whatever it might be. But all those types of things, low risk, high reward. And to me, I just think of it as asymmetric opportunity, shoot your shot. So uh, that's the biggest advice I would have. And I have to remind myself of this every day. But now, in the past, I used to do this. I would draft up a tweet and be like, yeah, I don't want to post it. Now, anytime I do that, I'm like, nope, got to click send. And it turns out, and it turns out those posts. <laughs> I'm sitting on a couple posts right now, bro. <laughs> okay, there we go. You got to go into those drafts. It turns out, here's the crazy thing. Always when I post those posts, they, they, they lead to something. They drive the engagement, et cetera. So that's a new rule. I'm like, no more. Don't draft it. Don't even open the drafts. If it's in the drafts, it's getting sent. And um, yeah. yeah, like. Send, send the email, tweet the tweet, text the text, whatever it might be, but shoot your shot there. Close mouths, don't get fed at the end of the day. Facts. Uh, absolutely. Um, one last, any bit of advice you'd give, give your younger self um, to expedite your success? I'm pausing because there's so much. I mean, that's the thing. Where I, <laughs> I, everyone, I guess, wishes they could have the time machine um, to go back. But I think, um, I, I think the biggest thing would be Something I've realized about myself is I, I think I can execute well. If there's a specific task in front of me, I will, boom, just go right into it. But sometimes I'll go in the weeds or go too down it without zooming out or actually thinking, is this the right thing? So biggest advice I'd have is to my, to my old self is sometimes you have to move slow to move fast. It's kind of like, you know, you see the top of the mountain. I'm very eager to just start going straight up. And that means you're going to bushwhack, go through trees, like hacking things down, get scratches everywhere. Or you could stop, like, let's look for the trailhead map. Like, let's go find it. Or maybe, you know, I'll look up the map on my phone. And you might not get the perfect map, but you at least see, okay, like, that's an extra bushy or extra forest area. Here's a clear path. And you've, you've taken that time up front, but it allows you to go faster. So to me, that's the biggest thing is like, you know, an ounce of preparation is worth a pound of the cure or, you know, Whatever it is, ounce of medicine is worth a pound of the cure, ounce of preparation is worth a pound of your time, whatever you want to call it. Um, but yeah, time is the single most val- valuable thing. And especially now, I mean, more than ever, I've just realized a lot of what we're doing now, technically, the things I've learned, could have done years ago. Nothing was stopping me except in here thinking, oh, I'm not ready to do this. Or I didn't know, I didn't learn LLCs. I learned this all on the go. And then I think to myself, why didn't I, why didn't I start learning about this four years ago? If anything, maybe there's a bigger opportunity then. So that would be the biggest thing is for me personally, a little more planning, a little more thinking, then go deep in, deep in, and then pull out 15 days, 30 days, whatever it might be, one week sprints, et cetera, and then evaluate things there. Nice. Um, if there's one person uh, that you think I should should be on this show in, in an interview, who, who would that be that you know that can tell an amazing story? Because what you just said, all your advice – is gold for for our audience someone who i have been following who i think has awesome content i haven't met personally but i guess interact with on social media is cody sanchez she talks about okay. building this portfolio of boring businesses and what i really like about it is she's very public with how she builds um shares like these very unsexy businesses like laundromats that can actually be very profitable and just shares like really great business advice from her learnings along the way so I think I know of her. I think Matt Gray, I, I could probably meet her through Matt Gray. Oh, very cool. Um, if you know who, who he is. Uh, um, Cody Sanchez. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to try and book yes. her. Yes, shoot, your, <laughs> shoot your shot. Shot. Exactly. <laughs> Tweet the tweets, send the text the text, email the email. Exactly. <laughs> Do all three, actually. Exactly. Yes. But I found sometimes it's the triple pick. Like, send a text or cold email, ask for an intro, cold and a LinkedIn email. message. And then you you three extra chances there. Even if they're very low, you've three extra yeah, you you use seamless AI for cold email. I've used seamless in the past. Also, another cool tool is Apollo.io. It can do a similar email scraping or email enrichment. Um, but yeah, that's another great point. The tools exist today to get the email, and then that's the thing. Everyone has the email, but now what are you going to write in that cold email to get someone to respond? And you can't do a stock message. You got to do a bit of research and understand like what's going to pique their attention, deliver some value up front, etc. But and if they don't respond, they're busy. So follow up and then, you know, how many times can you follow up, et cetera? So, you know, don't need to call it quits too early. No, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's, that's the basic, that's the basics of sale. Like I was, I wrote a, a, a thing today about learning. And the one thing I think everyone should learn, regardless of what you're doing for your life is how to sell. 
and 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 like the this process of sales i think is such a it's such a it's hard work and dedication and it's just a unique skill set because everything's a sale like when i was negotiating with my daughter this morning about leaving the house was someone selling someone on something you know what i mean so everything's a sale from trying to get married to, to new business all of that so uh, i think sales are and then like you could get anyone's email online period and then you and then that message like you said is important to really curate and make sure that you've done some work and, and you're not lazy about it um because if you're lazy about it it's called spam <laughs> don't just <laughs> cold email someone you're spamming them um so arjun thank you so much uh for being on the show today um we're gonna we're gonna wrap it up so and everyone listening thank you for uh tuning in to the urban income show i hope you found this episode super informative and inspiring um please remember to subscribe to our channel follow us on social media and we'll catch you on the next one.